Good morning. I'm Sean Harper from University of Pennsylvania. I'm a member of AERA Council and president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. I would like to start by thanking President Vivian Gadsden for creating this uh, very incredible uh, panel for us uh, this morning on higher education access and opportunity. Um, we are in for a terrific conversation with a panel of expert scholars, as well as a leader here in Texas and a leader in the nation on these issues. Let me start first by introducing the panelists and then I'll introduce our guest. I'll start with Bill Tierney, who is a university professor and the Wilbur Kiefer Professor of Higher Education in the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. Bill is also founding director of the Puglius Center for Higher Education at USC. He is an AERA fellow. He also is a past president of AERA and a past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Our second panelist is Dr. Laura Perna, who is the James Reefy Professor of Higher Education in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Laura is also founding uh, director of the Penn Alliance for Higher Education and Democracy at Penn, also known as Penn Ahead. Uh, she too is an AERA fellow and a past vice president of AERA Division J. And she too is a past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Seated next to Laura is Professor Stella Flores, who is an associate professor in the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development at New York University where she also serves as Director of Access and Equity in the Steinhardt Institute for Higher Education Policy. Stella was recently elected to AERA Council and to the AERA Executive Board. Uh, you will hear from these three brilliant minds and experts on higher education access following a set of framing remarks from our featured speaker. Uh, Dr. Raymond Paredes is Commissioner of Higher Education at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, Dr. Paredes spent most of his academic career at UCLA, where for 30 years he taught as an English professor, and for a decade he was vice president, or vice chancellor rather, for academic development. Additionally, he served as special assistant to the president of the University of California system on outreach efforts to improve access to higher education for students from educationally underserved communities. Prior to joining the coordinating board here in Texas, Dr. Paredes was director of creativity and culture at the Rockefeller Foundation, then vice president for programs at the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce and bring to the mic, Dr. Paredes. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning among such uh, distinguished uh, scholars. I remember when I was a scholar myself, uh, that was some years ago. Uh, now I find myself uh, uh, as a commissioner of higher education in Texas. And let me tell you a little bit about the work I do. I'm the uh, I'm commissioner of the higher education uh, court. I'm commissioner of higher education and I'm CEO of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, which by state statute and this is a quote, represents the highest authority for higher education in Texas. We have a, a, a number of responsibilities, a key among which are number one, to make sure that we deploy uh, higher education resources around the state equitably so that uh, every young person in every region of, of the state has a chance to get a first class uh, higher education. That wasn't always the case, there were some lawsuits for example, in South Texas a number of years ago, because for up until the uh, early 1990s, there wasn't a single doctoral granting institution in South Texas. You would have to, you would have to drive, uh, I think you, probably the closest place was to drive to Austin, which is about 350 miles from some of the key uh, population centers in South Texas to get, uh, to get a doctorate degree. We also approve all academic programs, uh, from bachelor's programs uh, to uh, doctoral programs in our public institutions. We oversee all the financial aid programs, statewide financial aid programs, and we make policy recommendations to the legislature regarding changes in statute and changes, the changes in policy. 
that's I, what I want to do is talk about uh, the expansion of dual credit in Texas over the past uh, 10 years or so and talk about what we got right in terms of policy and what we didn't get right and what we still don't know. And uh, the, the, the takeaway, and I've, I've been to uh, AERA meetings before, and uh, I've always been struck by the fact that uh, we don't do a very good job in our, in our graduate programs and education and allied fields in teaching people how to convert research into policy. Not very many people know how to do it, and very few people know how to do it well. And I can tell you that uh, uh, we have people uh, testify all the time on particular bills or particular recommendations, and we ask, well, what are the policy implications of, their, of your research? And we get blank stares. So I can tell you that, that as you do your research, think about the policy implications and think we need to do differently or what we need to do better. Let me uh, create a, a bit of a context for the dual credit uh, discussion. Uh, uh, as commissioner, one of uh, my main concerns is, uh, is college readiness. Obviously, we can't do our job in, in higher education if uh, K through 12 isn't doing its job well in terms of getting students ready for college. And the simple fact of the matter is, uh, and this is critical to the expansion of dual credit programs, the fact of the matter is Texas doesn't do a very good job of getting students ready for college. Uh, we have some state tests, which I don't have very much confidence in. Uh, the tendency is to lower the rigor of, uh, of, uh, of standardized tests, state tests over time. So we rely primarily on uh, national assessments of uh, college readiness. And let me give you some numbers. According to SAT, about 33% of uh, Texas test takers are college ready. According to the TSIA, the Texas Success Initiative Assessment, which we developed uh, with the College Board, what we like about this test in particular is it's specifically aligned with Texas College Readiness Standards. It's aligned with the curriculum that's supposed to be taught, taught in Texas high schools. It also has a diagnostic component so that uh, we can use that test. So instead of subjecting students to a year of uh, of developmental ed and math, we can pinpoint the weaknesses and ideally take care of them in a much shorter period of time. According to TSIA, 30% of Texas test takers, these are mostly, of course, juniors and seniors, uh, are college ready. And according to ACT, which now tests nearly as many students in Texas as uh, the College Board does, 26% of Texas test takers are college ready across the board in the four disciplines that they test. And here's a scary statistic. According to ACT, 12% of Latinos in Texas who take the ACT are college ready across the board. If you think that number is appalling, for African Americans, it's 8%. 8%. Of African American students who take the ACT demonstrate college readiness across the board. Well, all kinds of bad consequences ensue from uh, uh, these uh, kinds of numbers. Uh, if you're if if you know you can't do college level work, you're less likely to go. And the fact of the matter is that only 57 percent of Texas high school graduates uh, go to uh, go to college. Uh, the highest achieving states send about. Uh, almost 70% of their high school graduates, that creates a tremendous deficit in terms of uh, the economic competitiveness of Texas down the road. Uh, we uh, uh, we uh, don't uh, do a very good job in taking care of students who are not well prepared to do college uh, level work. Uh, we just have the latest uh, data for the uh, 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 ending with the 20, 2016 school year. In Texas, if you're assigned to developmental math, you only have a 15% chance of passing out of developmental math and passing a college credit math course, 15%. If you uh, take a course in reading, developmental ed course in reading, you have about a 35% chance of passing out of developmental reading and passing a credit bearing course that uh, involves a lot of reading. 
if you're doing, uh, if you take a, a developmental ed course in uh, writing, you have only a 21% chance of passing uh, a writing intensive uh, college level course. Obviously, uh, these numbers are discouraging on any number of levels, but the simple fact of the matter is that, uh, uh, that this affects virtually everything that happens in higher education. Community colleges in Texas have a completion rate of approximately 27% uh, after six years. That's six years to complete a two-year uh, a, a two credential. Now that includes students that not only get an associate's degree, get a certificate, or transfer to university, only 27%. Our university graduation rates are not uh, nearly what they should be. We're right at the national average, about 59%. But those numbers mask a deeper reality, which is this. If you pull the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M University out of the calculation, because those are by far the two most selective institutions in the state and have by far the highest graduation rates, the six-year graduation rates for our universities are about 50%. And we have some universities that have graduation rates of 15%, 24%, 30%. To sum up uh, the state of, of, uh, of college readiness in Texas, uh, we, can, we do an eighth grade cohort study every year. We take, the, we take an eighth grade cohort and take that out 11 years. One year to finish the eighth grade, four years to finish high school, in six years to finish uh, some kind of uh, baccalaureate degree. And the last year for which we have data, which this is, uh, 27, this is 2017, so we have data going back to the eighth grade class of 20, uh, 26, 2006, and this is what we find. First of all, only 21% uh, of eighth graders will complete a college degree. Of among poor students, only 11% will complete a degree. If you're African-American, only 12% will. If you're Latino, only 13% will. So that's the context in which uh, higher education exists. Two more important points. The percentage of children in K-12, through public K-12 through in Texas, who are poor is 60%, and that number is increasing. And we know that poverty correlates with bad schools, low-performing schools, and poor educational outcomes. And we are now at the point where Latinos constitute uh, over 50% of the students in K-12. Well, that, gets us, that, that brings us to uh, the subject of uh, my talk, the state of uh, dual credit. As in, as in other states, uh, dual credit uh, was, was growing steadily, but not dramatically up until about 2009, 2010. It was considered to be a, a, an adequate tool to help uh, students get used to co the college experience to get a sense of what uh, rigor in college courses is like. It was a way of helping students acquire college credit before they finish, before they finished high school. Um, 2009, things changed dramatically and uh, over the past uh, eight years, uh, dual credit has increased by 650%. We've gone from 18,000 students to 133,000 students. Uh, those are, there are now uh, uh, approximately 140,000 students in uh, Texas taking Dual credit as of this year, the figure I just gave you was for the last year for which we have complete data, but we know that the number has gone up. And uh, we uh, understand the expansion of uh, dual credit. Uh, it's been expanding particularly in uh, poverty areas. Um, we're trying to, to expand it there. And the reason for this is we want to uh, contain the cost of higher education. Texas is right in the mid middle of the pack in terms of higher education costs. And we uh, started hearing complaints about, concerns about dual credit about three years ago. I would visit uh, high schools, I would visit uh, community colleges with, uh, that were offering dual credit programs, and a faculty member or a student or a 
citizen would pull me aside and say, do you know what's going on here? And I'd say, no, tell me. And he'd say, well, we have uh, high school teachers that are teaching dual credit courses that are simply handed the syllabus by the community college sponsoring the course. And they said, here's what you should teach. We have uh, high schools uh, in which uh, dual credit courses are offered and they're using high school textbooks because nobody can afford to pay for the college textbooks, which all of you know are enormously expensive. And uh, we, uh, we're also hearing stories that uh, universities and high schools were expanding community college, expanding dual credit for no other reason, no other reason than to get extra revenue from the state because they're paid for offering those courses. And we know that uh, state support for public higher education is declining all over the country. In the, in the context of all these situations, and I should say in 2015, we expanded dual credit without much research on this issue to now be available to freshmen and sophomores. And now there are a, a good number of exemptions that allow high schools to make decisions about allowing students to take uh, dual credit courses without having, pri in a prior manner, demonstrated college readiness. I testified not long ago and uh, I was asked, uh, well, if students enroll in a dual credit course and they can pass it, what difference does it make if they established college readiness earlier? And I said, anybody who's ever been in a classroom knows that's not the way it works. If you're teaching a class of 25, it doesn't matter what level it is. If you're teaching a class of 25 and 15 or 12 of the students, half the students can't do the work, you're not gonna flunk all those students. If you do, you're gonna get hauled before your department chair or, or dean about your, your grading practices. So I said, what will happen invariably in those situations is that uh, the rigor and uh, quality will be compromised in order to make sure that uh, an acceptable number of students actually pass the courses. Well, in, uh, in, in 2015, uh, I said, we don't, we, you know, we are, we are plunging more deeply into dual credit and we don't have any good data on how we're doing. And uh, the, the state doesn't provide uh, the coordinating board money typically to do research studies. So I raised money from the Houston Endowment and several other foundations in Texas, about $600,000 to do, to commission the Rand Corporation to do a study of dual credit. And here was a fundamental question I, I wanted to ask. We have approximately, as I mentioned a moment ago, about 140,000 students that are, do, that are taking dual credit courses. By my rough calculations on the back of an envelope, I figured out that we've got between 115 and 130,000 students in Texas high schools that are indeed college ready. So I said, where are all these students coming from that are going to continue to help us increase the number of students in, in, enrolled in these courses? And what's going to be the quality of these courses if that continues to happen? Well, we did a study, uh, we, or I should, should say we launched a study by the Rand Corporation. And uh, they only took the, they've only taken the preliminary data up to 2015 and uh, the data for dual credit in Texas before 2015, when we had that very dramatic expansion to freshmen and sophomores, was that we were doing pretty good. We were, in fact, we found out that students who took dual credit courses were much more likely to go to college, and they were much more likely to complete college. Their grade point averages went down, the grade point averages in college courses offered on college campuses were lower than they were in the dual credit courses, particularly the ones offered in high school. So environment makes a difference. And we found out that uh, the, the students uh, felt more confident about their ability to do college level work because of those courses. But we also found out some things that were, that were negative. We found out, which shouldn't have been a surprise, that African-Americans and Latinos had a lower uh, access rate to dual credit than Anglo students did. And for a very simple reason, we know that uh, the, the highest achieving teachers in terms of credentials and so forth, 
tend to cluster in affluent neighborhoods rather than schools with, uh, with, with poor kids. So the, uh, the teachers in high school that had master's degrees and were qualified to teach college level courses were not present in schools in poor neighborhoods. We also found out, what a surprise, that uh, very few dual credit uh, um, credits were being offered uh, in, uh, in STEM fields. In fact, of the 10 most popular dual credit courses being offered in Texas up until 2015, only one was a STEM course, and that was, of course, college algebra. But hardly any science being taken. All the students are getting credit in English and history and political science. Uh, and the, 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 the problem with that, of course, is if you take all your courses in those particular disciplines, a lot of those courses are not going to transfer to a university. You don't need those many credits. You don't need 30 credits in the humanities uh, in order for you to meet your general education requirements. So anyway, we, we found this out. We found out that uh, males participate in dual credit courses at much lower rates than, uh, than, uh, than girls do. Uh, we uh, uh, found out that uh, there was a shortage of uh, qualified teachers in, uh, in high schools uh, all over the state. And that was one of the reasons that there seemed to be evidence of cutting corners. And so we're left with, with policy that's in place that is based on an absence of, or I should say, is not based on good research or good evidence that these are sound practices to the state of Texas. I can tell you that it is troubling sometimes to see how we make law, how we make state policy based on so little evidence. We have uh, some questions that have to be uh, addressed. Uh, for example, uh, how are we going to get uh, more students to take uh, STEM courses? How do we uh, uh, expand uh, dual credit in uh, poor neighborhoods? How do we get more boys interested in dual credit? What about the issue that we haven't talked about? We have one school district in South Texas that uh, is embarked on giving uh, students an AD, uh, an ADN, an associate's degree in nursing by the time they graduate from high school. And then the question, the question I, the question I ask myself, do we want, uh, do, do we want by and large our, uh, our sick, our, our sick uh, family members to be taken care of by an 18 year old nurse? Is there a question of maturity? Is there a question of, uh, of, of, uh, of appropriate levels of responsibility and so forth? I'm not suggesting that uh, 18 year olds can't do the job. I'm suggesting we ought to take a look at that. Uh, we have other uh, questions about. Uh, Rigor? Are we measuring the wrong thing when we look at credentials? Is it really that you have a master's degree, or is the real question, do you know how to teach at, the college, at a college level? And we don't know that. These are some of the questions that uh, we are going to address in the second phase of this study that I, that I told you we've got underway. But once again, here is the, the, the critical question that all of you need to think about. How do we make sure that First of all, we do solid research that has policy implications. How do we make sure that we write that research in a way that is accessible to policymakers, which is to say it needs to be brief and it needs to be written in straightforward, accessible language? And how do we make sure that the research that we're doing is relevant to the political circumstances in which we find ourselves, in which we do our work? Uh, we need, I can tell you, we desperately need help at the state level. This is, I'm not talking just about Texas. I talk to my colleagues from other states all the time. We desperately need a much larger cadre of researchers who know how to turn that research into policy. Because if we don't have that, the consequences can be extremely dire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
So we will now bring our panelists into a conversation here with Dr. Paredes and me, and we will invite you into that conversation in a bit. But I want to start with uh, Bill Tierney. Um, Bill, I invite you and, and everyone else um, to react to particularly noteworthy aspects of uh, Raymond's remarks. And I certainly encourage you, Dr. Paredes, to respond to any questions that any of the panelists may have for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just begin by saying, for the folks in the back, the front row is pretty empty up here. And I always say to the students that I mentor, sit in the front of the lecture hall, because the 10th row is where distance learning begins. <laughs> so we've got seats up here. Now, it's great because some of these people are coming up because the students I mentor never sit in the front of the room. <laughs> Now, the impact of uh, research and policy is something that is near and dear to my heart, as is college readiness. I thought I, I would jump off on Ray's comments in a bit of a different way. Let's make believe that it is 2042, 25 years from now. And I'd like us to think about what is similar and what's different in 25 years. Now, what's the same is that inequity has remained with us. That's the critical theorist in me. And I do think for this crowd and this conference, an understanding of theory and arguing about theory is important. But now what's changed? What's changed in 2042 is the relationship between K through 12 and higher education. If you look at the 20th century, it will be remembered as a time where there was a, a large wall between K through 12 and higher education. There was very little communication or coordination. In 2042, that wall will have been torn down. And in general, I think all on this panel would say that it is better to tear walls down than build them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there will be much more communication and coordination. Now, dual enrollment is one possible instrument to increase access, but it is not the silver bullet. It's not the only one. And there are many potential problems, as there are with any public policy, because you get a public policy and then you have to implement it. And we know from research what the problems are, and Ray referred to them. The courses might not be rigorous. The courses might simply be a way for a community college to increase its revenue. The courses <coughs> might not increase learning or reduce time to degree. The courses might be taught by high school teachers, and they may focus on narrow vocational skills, not even history and, and literature, much less STEM. Now, all of these problems have been, been unearthed with regard to dual enrollment. We know all that. We also know, done rightly, dual enrollment can be useful for kids, especially those stuck in crappy schools. It can reduce cost for a student since it's subsidized. It can reduce time to degree. There's no assurance, but it can. It can help students master what I think of as college knowledge, non-cognitive skills. In effect, it gets them started sooner and makes for a smoother transition than the abrupt movement from high school to college. But it's not a game changer, and we're not going to see it in 2042. However, it starts us in the right direction. And for that, it deserves applause. Here's what we're going to see in 2042. Students will finish high school sometime in their senior year, and they will begin taking college classes, frequently on campus or online. In effect, freshman year will begin in about January of what we now think of as senior year in high school, where really the most important thing that happens in second semester of senior year in high school is who you're going to take to the prom. <laughs> But these classes will begin in January and they will go straight through to September. Those students who are behind in their cognitive and non-cognitive skills will be ready by September. No more remediation. 
All these courses will be taught by people like the ones on this panel. There will be very precise pre-tests and post-tests to measure learning. There will not only be much greater synthesis between high school and college, but also within an institution. The point that Ray referred to in terms of students wasting credits will be, have been eliminated. Students will get the courses that they need and when they need them. Dropout rates will dramatically shrink and most students will graduate within a three year time horizon, three and a half year time horizon. Now here's the thing. We actually know through research how to do this now. Hmm. We don't have to wait until 2042, but there are two problems. We say we don't have the money and we don't have the will. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Bill. Laura? Great, so thank you very much for being here today. Um, like all of us, I think we think uh, on the panel, we're thinking a lot about how we connect research to policymakers. And one of the challenges, I think, for academic researchers is that we don't have a lot of opportunity uh, to talk directly with people doing the policy making. And so to hear your perspective and to have you come to our conference is, is really wonderful. And one of the things that we've been talking about in some other sessions is just how valuable it is for us to go out and uh, speak with different people who are actually doing the work and trying to solve these really important problems. Um, so thank you. It's also, on another level, um, interesting and uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to hear you talk. Uh, Joni Finney and I have a book, The Attainment Agenda, and uh, it's a, we did studies of five states trying to understand the relationship between public policy and higher education attainment. Texas was one of our states, and so we spent time in Texas, including in San Antonio, trying to understand what's happening within a state context. And one of the arguments that we make is that it's really important for us to understand what's happening in particular states. Texas is uh, unique in many ways. Um, and I think you did a nice job of outlining some of the- We think that Texas is unique in every way. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna go, I lived in Texas for a while. Texas is a special place. Um, <laughs> in the fullest meaning of the <laughs> yeah. uh, But really important and interesting from an academic research perspective, right? And understanding the context has to be at the foundation before we can try to understand what particular policies and practices might work here in this particular place. Texas is also clearly very important uh, with the diversity of the population. Um, and it's such a diverse state too. We talk in the book how it's really many states within one in some ways, given the differences and the characteristics that are across the, the state. One of the things that we highlight in our chapter on Texas is the closing the gaps plan that you have here. And I think one of the real strengths, and this came across in your talk too, is the, um, the data that you have available to really describe and document what the situation is. It has to be at a foundation from a policy perspective as well as the research perspective, really understanding what are um, the outcomes for students of different demographic backgrounds and different characteristics as we move, uh, as students move across the educational pipeline. Um, so I think that's really an important um, dimension of this. We know from the data, as you talked about, how important the transition is between K through 12 and higher education. And this is an issue that's um, not unique to Texas, but clearly we're losing too many students as students try to figure out how to you know, presumably graduate from high school and then discover not to be college ready and have to participate in <coughs> developmental courses. And that has cost to the students, it has cost to our uh, institutions and to our society. Figuring out how to improve that um, alignment is, is challenging. And so I think the attention here to dual enrollment is, um, is important and you know, I appreciate the leadership that um, you're trying to provide on that. Understanding how it actually plays out though is an important, there are a lot of questions that I hope we as a community begin to um, look more carefully at. So I have a study that's looked at the effects of participation in the International Baccalaureate Program, another type of initiative 
that's designed to help improve the alignment between K through 12 and higher education. And a couple of findings there, I think, are, are relevant in understanding how dual enrollment plays out. So um, one is that um, implementation matters. So even you know something that's called dual, dual credit or international baccalaureate, it, it operates differently in individual schools and how it, what it actually is is something that we have to pay attention to for under, understanding whether it quote unquote works, right? So what is the program that's being implemented? A second is who's participating. So one of the things that we found is that kids who participate in IB are really, really different than kids who don't, right? And so understanding who is participating in dual credit is super important. And some of it's structural in terms of the characteristics that you mentioned. You know, having teachers who can teach these courses varies across schools. But there are also important dimensions that play out within schools in terms of who gets access to the opportunities. And we have to be paying attention to that, right? Because that's a subtle way in which stratification happens for outcomes that are super important. Um, and we know, and so I think paying attention to those issues um, is it warrants more attention. So um, those are the types of questions. And one, one of the things with, just one other point before I pass it on to Stella is, you know, thinking about how we know whether a program is working. So the data, I think, that were presented here about um, the positive effects of dual credit are without taking into account the self-selection of students. Yeah. And that's a really, we have to be paying attention to that, right? So um, outcomes are better for students who participate in dual credit, but there's a selection issue going on there. And so it's not, we don't really fully understand yet the extent to which the program is making a difference. So, so Dr. Paredes, before we go to Stella, do you have any response to anything that either Laura or Bill said in their responses? Well, I, I think uh, Laura's comment about uh, we don't have data on certain issues is certainly true. Uh, it turns out that this RAND uh, study is going to have a qualitative component as well. Mm -hmm. And we're going to interview students who decided not to take dual credit, who seem to be uh, college ready, but uh, we're not taking the, uh, those courses when they were readily available. So we hope to, to get at that issue. But uh, no, I, I think the comments uh, were all uh, we're all thoughtful. Uh, clearly, we we don't have the alignment between K through 12 and higher ed that we need. Uh, there was a recent circumstance here in Texas where uh, the uh, chair of the state board of education, and, and that's a an elected position, asked me to uh, convene a group of uh, scholars and and uh, and uh, uh, teachers from both community colleges and universities to give her some uh, some feedback on the new, uh, uh, the new uh, TEKS and TEKS assessment of knowledge and skills. And uh, we, uh, we put together a very good group of people who, who did that, and they came up with some recommendations that ran directly contrary uh, to the ones that were made by the group that the State Board of Education appointed. And that caused uh, their op-ed pieces flying back and forth about uh, this was an infringement of... Uh, of uh, the of, of uh, standard practice, and uh, uh, there, there, was, there was actually the, the implication: Why is higher education getting involved in developing college readiness mm -hmm. standards? Mm -hmm. That's the purview of K through mm twelve. -hmm. And I, I keep saying, and I I know that uh, I annoy the hell out of K through twelve leaders when I say this. I said, look, whether you like it or not, college readiness is determined by college and university faculty and first year college courses. They could have had a four point zero average. They could have scored 2,200 on the SAT, they can't pass a freshman composition class. They're not college ready. And K-12 uh, doesn't like to hear that. So that's when that was a point that Bill made. We need mm -hmm. to align higher ed and public ed better. Nobody's been very good at it. We will come back in a few moments and re-engage the topic of metrics of college readiness. Um, I just want to say that I'm, I'm happy to hear that there's going to be a qualitative portion of the study. You know, Laura's perspective around uh, self-selection, I think, is a really important one. But it also has me thinking about the role that agents within schools, uh, college counselors and teachers play in steering certain students toward these opportunities and not others. For example, we know from the AP uh, report to the nation 
that nearly 80% of African American students who should be taking AP courses, their PSAT scores would suggest that they uh, would succeed in those, are not taking AP courses. And their cor those courses are actually offered in their schools. Um, my sense is that it's not because black students don't want to be in AP courses, it's because their teachers and counselors are not strategically steering them uh, toward those courses. So I wonder if that might also be, how might you account for that in either the qualitative component or in some other aspect of the RAND study? Well, we're going, we're going to take a look at that issue. We, we uh, among the people that we uh, have interviewed for and are going to interview include uh, counselors and teachers. And we're going to try to get a sense of uh, how they feel about making sure that students are prepared to do college level work regardless of their uh, racial or ethnic identities or socioeconomic circumstances are uh, encouraged to do so. But we hope we'll get some kind of handle on that. Yeah, I think that will be a really important part of this, right? Um, I don't know the teacher demographics here in Texas, but nationally, 81% of K-12 teachers are white. That's about the percentage here. And the counseling profession is even wider. Yes. So I wonder if teachers, white teachers and white counselors are even fully aware of, you know, the ways in which they think about which particular groups of students are deserving of and likely to succeed in these kinds of opportunities. I think we'll find that there are, there are, there are some uh, uh, biases uh, that uh, have an impact on on uh, choices students make, and I'm sure that uh, many times uh, those biases are are not uh, are, are, are 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 not accepted or not believed by the teachers and counselors. Yeah, let's bring Professor Flores into the conversation. Hi, everyone. I think I'm the only native Texan here, so I must be the most special person on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a native Texan. You are a native Texan, yes. you are both special. And, I, and I, forgot, I forgot to say in my introduction of you, Stella, that Stella is also a real expert on higher education in Texas. Uh, she spent lots of her career deeply studying Texas. Thank you, Sean. So I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you know, so those of us who know the Valley know it's 90% Hispanic. Um, and I was actually, and I'm gonna age myself here, in, the, in high school in the early 90s, we were part of a pilot program for dual enrollment mm -hmm. where um, we were somehow selected as doing well in math. We had taken trigonometry. So then an instructor from UT Pan American at the time came over to, um, to provide a pre-calculus class. And then in that summer, before our senior year, we took calculus at the university. And it was actually, it was a great experience. We all supported each other. We were this cohort of five or six students, um, maybe more. By the time I got to cal calculus, we weeded out a bit. But um, what I found when I went to Rice University then, which is a very selective school, was that I was able to compete in the, the non, um, right, hot, hardcore STEM courses that were for non-math majors. Now that I think about it, that those courses just allowed me to stay afloat. I barely made it to the party with that. And for, so for me, I'm actually very excited to see a dual enrollment statewide policy. Now there are gonna be problems with it, but I think that's the only way to really keep our students afloat. And I am happy to see Texas focus on a K through 16 agenda. I think it's exactly in the right direction. And you know, I've been you know, playing with these data, studying these data since 2009. We've done analysis on cohorts from 1997 to 2008. We know how English learners are doing, how black students are doing, how white students are, are doing, how Asian students are going. I'm happy to refer you to those publications. And the story here is that dual enrollment does matter, right? It is actually one of the highest coefficients in our studies for in terms of not only college enrollment and college completion, acknowledging the high self-selection character of dual enrollment. But more than that, and, and the commissioner noted this, but I think maybe what we have here is less about opportunity if it's a statewide um, policy now, but it's now opportunity of take up and opportunity of quality. And, and we've all noted this, but it really is in the numbers. 
And the group that is really missing the opportunity because of structural reasons or whatever, the bias reasons are black students. In our work, we see that, let's take trigonometry. Let's say dual enrollment never existed. The, the gap between uh, students, white students and black students who take trigonometry in our work is 23 percentage points. And these are college enrollees. The gap with Latino students is closer to 10 points. And what we see over time is that the gap in um, dual enrollment and in APIB courses for Latinos and whites has closed over time, not totally, but has certainly um, gone in the right direction. But the, the gap between black and white students has increased. And even if we look within the black community, within black student and college enrollees who go to HBCUs versus non-HBCUs, non those rigorous course enrollments, the gap has doubled. And then if we look deeper, what schools are there, what, are there any characteristics associated with schools that are, are pointing to this and its level of racial segregation? It's whether you are in an urban school or not. So by, when we say opportunity, when I say opportunity of quality, it goes beyond whether the student and the counselor are offering this conversation about APO. This, this is a bigger issue of school quality that's tied to racial concentration, racial segregation, whatever word you prefer. I get, I get, um, I don't know, people get mad when I say segregation <laughs> sometimes, but it's segregation, folks. Um, and so my, my point here being, you know, we're able to see this also, right? And I'm not defending Texas because I'm a Texan. This is a pure research <laughs> uh, position. Texas has the, some of the best data in the nation where we can unpack all this. I've been unpacking this since 2009. And part of my mission has been to find out where the opportunity spots are and where the barrier spots are. And we need to do a better job with the black community and black schools and their access to opportunity. And now that we're looking at a K through 16 perspective, which is fantastic, let's look beyond the schools to understand why school quality is so poor for some families and why it is not for others. Great, thank you, Stella. Any reactions? No, I think Stella's right. And uh, she's uh, mined a lot of the data at the high, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. I, there, there are a lot of things that we don't understand uh, nearly as, as well as we do. My, my point, uh, I wanted to just underscore a point I'd made about uh, dual credit. W w the, our data suggests, uh, as Stell pointed out, that dual credit has worked. The question that I'm concerned about is whether it will continue to work, at least in the ways that it has worked, now that we've thrown the doors open for virtually anybody to take these courses. We're already beginning to see signs that, uh, that some of our more selective universities are very worried about the rigor of dual credit courses because they've expanded so much. Um, what happens in public policy is we hear that something's working well and immediately there's a rush to expand it without the due diligence in terms of uh, getting some research data. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are briefing, we had a, a briefing for the legislature on the status of dual credit about halfway through the, uh, uh, the current legislative session. Well, that's not enough time to change anybody's mind about uh, whether something uh, should be expanded or not. Uh, as I said, the, the, there's, there's a real question about uh, how much of our policy making is genuine, genuinely uh, based on solid research. I think this concern the commissioner raises is, is absolutely true. And, and this is just a product of an educational arms race. And I got that word from Jeannie Oaks, who said, it's an arms race. As soon as you get the poor kids caught up with the right courses, the rich kids have already found three other ways to do it better. So maybe that's the question we should be thinking about. But I don't think the nature of that conflict is ever going to go away. So I'm not sure what to do about that. But I think, you know, if it wasn't dual credit, it would have been some other potential magic bullet that those with privilege will figure out how to make better as the rest of us are catching up. Let's talk for a moment about standardized tests. 
Um, so I so appreciate it that you raised them in your remarks. Um, what are some reliable indicators of college readiness beyond standardized test scores? Well, we take we take a look at uh, we take a look at uh, the rigor of uh, the courses that students have taken. We take into account the number of AP courses, uh, dual credit courses, other indications of going beyond uh, the regular curriculum or the normal curriculum. Uh, we take into account uh, um, uh, socioeconomic factors as well. We know Texas is a state, uh, particularly because of uh, the University of Texas uh, having all these court cases regarding affirmative action. We've, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at holistic, holistic uh, uh, assessments and uh, we think uh, they work. We do them in terms of development-led placement. Uh, we take in, into account, for example, uh, the difference between students who need remediation and students who need uh, refresher courses. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of students who go to college after having graduated from high school 10 years earlier. Uh, single mothers who've raised families and uh, find themselves in economic difficulty and know that they have to get more education in order to be able to take care of their families. And we find out that, that uh, they were valedictorians in the high school classes, but they couldn't pass a um, uh, college prep assessment because they haven't done any academic work in 10 years. But that, that person is, 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 is different, has different needs from the person who never learned the information to begin with. So we, we, we're looking at issues like that as well. But we're, we're trying to refine our ability to assess what students are capable of and what their past performance demonstrates. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other perspectives? Yeah, I got a few thoughts. Let me let me give an example. I, I have a summer writing program for for low income kids who are going to college. They're, they've been admitted to a four year institution. So in terms of college readiness, readiness, and I'm thinking very specifically about these group of students. These are students who come from some of the worst schools in Los Angeles. The college going rates in the high schools may be as low as 15 percent. But these students in spring of senior year have been admitted to a four-year institution. And all of a sudden, they recognize that, whoa, I don't know if I'm prepared or not. So we have a writing program. And I could look anybody in the eye and say that in the space of a month, working with us five hours a day, five days a week, they, we can improve their writing skills by about a grade level. Okay. Now, here's the first indicator of college readiness for me. We, we ask for a student to be admitted to the program, there are three things we ask. They have to have been admitted to a four-year institution. They have to have a letter from the college counselor, a high school person or something. And they have to give us one five-page paper that they've written in the last four years, just so that we can gauge their writing skills. More often than not, they have never written a five-page yeah. paper. Right. Now, come on. I, I mean, so we've got a problem. These same students will have placed out, they've completed the eighth, what we call the A through G requirements in California that may, supposedly makes them college ready to going to college. And they will not have taken math, high school math, since junior year. So they've got at least 18 months where there's no math going on. So that's a problem. Third problem in terms of non-cognitive skills. Most of these kids of, of ours have never set foot in a college campus. What about culture shock there? And the last point, just, you know, I don't want to get myself in even more trouble than I get around here, but, you know, Sarah Goldrick Rabb wrote this week about financial literacy. By no means am I blaming these kids. I know the system needs more money and all that stuff. But if you, if you, if you and your family have never worked with a bank, don't really know the difference between loans and grants. The lingo that my students have, it's not a grant, it's free money. That's how they, that's the way they think. If you don't know that, it's going to be harder for you to figure out how to navigate all these different issues. So those are four, you know, if I'm looking at, at college readiness, those are four things that make a big difference for the students that I work with. Bill, I have a, a clarifying question. So you said that the students in your program recognize that they're not college ready. How do they recognize it's that? It's not that they recognize they're not college ready. All of a sudden, it's real. 
-hmm. you know, they go, holy mackerel, I'm going to college. And, you know, so as opposed to between junior year and senior year, and you say, do you want to take a writing class? And they go, I got a lot of other things to do. In senior year, it's right in front of them. And, and they, all they know is that high school is, college is different from high school. And it's dramatically different. And if you're the first in your family, which all these kids are, it's, it's scary. And that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Laura? So um, building on those comments, um, well, and stepping back for a second. So one of uh, my early observations about Texas was uh, Texas, I think, was the first state to make the college preparatory curriculum in high school the default. So you had to opt out not to be in the college prep curriculum, which very important, right, given um, the different pathways you could be on as early as high school and, and um, you know, presumably students taking courses with the expectations that we'll, they'll be ready for college. And so I was very excited when that happened. It's like, okay, this is going to put students on track, eliminate some of the complexity, right? So how do you really make right. choices about what the right courses are to take if you, you, you don't know how to navigate the system? And, and then there are really important consequences there. Well, of course, it turns out that just being in a college preparatory curriculum doesn't mean that you are college ready. And defining that, I think, is a really good question. I think one of the broader issues that we all have to think about with Texas and with other states is just how much complexity there is in our system, right? Yeah. So each college and university gets to define what it, how it thinks about college readiness. And so that creates an information challenge for students and families, no matter, especially for the folks who are um, you know, first generation, low income, um, racial ethnic minority groups, you know, there's, there's, that's an important part of this process. And then, of course, there are the other complexities, you know, Bill talked about some of them, but figuring out how to navigate these other aspects of our higher education system is really, really complex. So understanding how students get information about curriculum, about financial aid, about what the right, quote unquote, right college choice is, and how we ensure that everyone has access to the right types of information at the right times is, is it, we have a long way to go on those issues. So we have a half hour left. This will be my last question for the panel, and then we'll open it up for some questions and conversation with you. Um, so this presidential session is about strategically improving pathways to higher education and in increasing higher education access. Let's imagine for a moment that it were not Raymond sitting right next to us, but instead U.S. Secretary uh, Betsy DeVos. Um, <laughs> For, for a moment, right? Um, what advice might we give our nation's chief education officer on strategically improving access to higher education for more Americans? And, you know, let's think, you know, very critically about, you know, efforts that are scalable and replicable. Okay, no heckling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think I think structurally we, we, we need to uh, we need to create new structures that that instead of hoping that higher education and public education will work more, more closely together, we mandate it. Uh, we, we, we create structures that that, uh, that that demand that level of cooperation. I, I thought that a, that a really smart thing we did in in Texas about uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago when we were developing uh, new college readiness standards, the bill that, that uh, caused that to happen uh, was uh, just said very explicitly that the committees that will develop college readiness standards in four major disciplinary areas will be composed of 60% faculty from higher education and 40% uh, high school faculty and then when you get to the implementation stage, those percentages will be flipped. 60% high school teachers, because of course, that's where the work would, would have to be done, and 40%. And, and I, I think we can, we, we can, we can create uh, new uh, levels of collaboration, cooperation between the two sectors, but it's not likely to happen on a volunteer basis. Uh, the, the Commissioner of Public Education in Texas 
uh, and I are very good friends. And we always talk about getting together at least once a month. Never happens. Hmm. Uh, it's, 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 we're, we're too busy. And unless we are required to do it, it's just not going to happen at the level it needs to. Um, I'll give it a shot. Uh, but again, I think that that was very wise, and I agree with that. Um, Secretary DeVos, please do not ignore demography. Embrace it. And knowing that what happens in high school or even earlier matters for college completion, increasing the degrees in this country means whatever you do in K through four, K through 12 has enormous consequences for degree production in this country. So I think, again, the message of understanding how important K through 12 is for college completion, but also for Assistant Secretary of Higher Education um, or to, of higher education in the country to, to do their part, right? To also understand what happens in K through 12. Um, and then finally, this idea of financial literacy, which all the experts and practitioners seem to know that it matters, but it also matters in a country where over 60% of the population, population growth has been from immigrants and children of immigrants. So financial literacy needs to go beyond English language products. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. going down the line, uh, so I uh, feel I think all those things correct with regard to the K through 12. I would, um, if I were to have two minutes with her, would really stress the money part. So, in addition to college academic readiness, we have to pay attention to money, how students pay the cost of higher education, um, focusing on need based financial aid, Pell grants, of course, um, and recognizing the reality that men. So many of our students now are using loans to pay college costs and paying attention to what that means. So who's borrowing, who's not borrowing, what are the consequences of borrowing um, to, you know, with regard to default and other uh, types of um, perhaps positive outcomes, but paying attention to some of the ways in which students, especially the students who we most need to be targeting resources to, the ways in which they're experiencing loans and, um, and realizing positive outcomes through uh, completion and, and better paying jobs and things like that. We have to ensure that everyone is well informed. We have so much complexity in our financial aid system um, and with regard to the mechanisms that are available to help students if they have trouble repaying loans. So it's just really complicated and we have to have more attention to reducing the complexity. So the um, action or the, the talk around uh, loan servicers and backing away from that. We actually need a more streamlined system that makes mm -hmm. things easier for students to navigate, not more complex. And we have to figure out how to protect students against risks, right? So how to ensure that um, you protect students from low performing institutions, strengthen income-based repayment. And we also need to have uh, attention to advancing research on what we know, right? So there is a lot of attention to um, the importance of improving financial literacy, for example, but we don't know so much from our research about how actually to do that, mm -hmm. right? What are the effective interventions for different groups? Great. Mm -hmm. right. uh, it's sort of special to think Mrs. DeVos and I are on the same panel. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not gonna hold my breath, but I would encourage all of us, and I mean this sincerely, that you do contact Mrs. DeVos and you do provide suggestions for her and recommendations. The more messages that the federal government gets from us, the better it is. I sent her an email about a month ago and she wrote back, actually. Good, good. I don't think she's very busy right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> my, sense, my sense is that also with the secretary, as with the others in the government, that we need to sort of dial it back. So it's higher ed 101. And for this association, it's research 101. So, you know, what do I want to emphasize with her? I want to emphasize that um, research that's done by the department, you know, sanctioned by the department is peer reviewed. And it's peer reviewed by people like this, people in this association. 
which again is a strange thing to have to say, but we have to say it. Also that research that is done with findings is owned by the researcher and it is disseminated. It's not embargoed if it has to, happens to disagree with mm. the findings of, or the thoughts of the administration. A third point if we want to increase access is that we have to regulate the for-profit industry. That the deregulation of the for-profit industry, which is going to happen with the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. So the deregulation of that will increase student debt, not increase access, and increase the cost to the to the not only the consumer but the but the administration. A fourth point is that they should continue to uh, fund experiments like First in the World that mm -hmm. try to find out what are the best practices. Now, coming full circle to Ray's point, the really strange thing that the Obama administration and, and the First in the World experiments is there was no money, there is no money for dissemination. Mm -hmm. So we come up with all these neat findings, but you're never going to hear about them because we don't have any money for it. So they need to go further rather than, than get retarded. And just to tie on to Laura's point and be very specific, we need to fund summer money in Pell Grants for students. That will make a difference. And if, they, if she were to do all those five things, I'd be pretty darn pleased. Yeah. I would just simply add, too, that um, we ought not discontinue the civil rights data collection, yeah. um, which gives us a lot of information about what's happening in K-12 schools around college opportunity and college readiness. Why don't we open this up for some conversation with the audience? Uh, sure. So I think it's a trade-off in data sets, right? Like the, the data I use, as beautiful of a data set it is, it doesn't have those elements to understand. And so that is a limitation um, that I, me and my research partners should probably acknowledge more because I think it is very, very important. So um, that's the easy way of saying, you know, that's why I don't deal with it. But if, if it were available, I th you know, I think ba better data collaboration, interoperable data sets, ways that we can think about that better while pro protecting the privacy of, of students um, would help us make it as part of the policy agenda. I think that's where the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the critical issue of mentoring comes in. Uh, there's, there's so much data available around the country that mentoring first-generation college students can make a decisive difference in their educational outcomes. And the mentoring that, uh, it, it, we're not talking about tutoring, we're not talking about college advising, we're talking about those life skills that so many first generation students uh, uh, don't have. And I, I've seen it work in, in any number of cases. We, we've had uh, some very successful mentoring programs at the University of Houston. We've had some very successful ones at Texas Southern University. And you can see the you, you can see the difference in educational outcomes as soon as those programs are put into place, and uh, I, I think we've we've, we've seen it at uh, at the national level. Uh, I, I was uh, I was involved with a very close friend of mine when the the hundred black man was established in Los Angeles thirty years ago, and once again you could see the effects almost immediately. I think we underestimate uh, the, the importance of mentoring for these uh, students. And, and uh, that's where a lot of this, these so-called soft skills uh, are developed, those kinds of situations. But the, the evidence on mentoring is a bit mixed. 
because I think it depends on the kind of mentoring, right? right. right? Um, you know, efforts that just simply, you know, randomly pairs, you know, a kid with an adult and magic is supposed to happen between them. That doesn't work so well. Um, but I would imagine that in the summer writing initiative in the Puglia Center that Bill mentioned, that you're not just teaching them how to write, but there are also other conversations that happen there much more organically and it becomes a mentoring space as well as a writing workshop space. It's those kinds of, and those forms of mentoring that tends to produce the kinds of, the kinds of outcomes that, um, that, that, that are helpful. I, I agree with that. I, I've, uh, I've seen examples of that. We, we uh, uh, f provided seed funding for a project called Project Males Oh, yeah. which you probably know about. Victor and, uh, Sines. And, Victor Sines yeah. did it and, and, and a couple of others. And uh, when they developed a training component, you could see the success yeah. rates. I was on the, uh, uh, the National Board of Directors for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and it's very clear that the quality of training that, uh, that is provided to the so-called bigs makes a huge difference in the outcomes for the littles. Right. You know, my sense is that there's one thing I've found in the last 20 years is that the students I work with will rise to the level that's set for them. Mm -hmm. That they're not lazy. They're not, you know, don't have aspirations. But we've got to set aspirations. They, they get onto these gigantic campuses and they're anonymous. So they don't know how to manage time to come to your question. Because they've, they've had a bell culture for, for all of high school, 8 o'clock, 8.50, you know. And all of a sudden, they find out, man alive, how great is this? Classes, Monday, Wednesday, I'll take nine hours each day. And I got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, and a lot of these kids will then say, and I can work, like at Ralph's, the grocery store, yeah. which is not a, a helpful thing. Middle class and upper class kids come to a college campus with a right of appropriation. I got a cold, go to the infirmary. For the kids I work with, I got a cold, deal with it. Or, I, go, or go home. Well, or right. if I get really sick, go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So the thought that there's something called a clinic, that because you're paying, you don't know that, but you're paying for it, that you can use that clinic just like the middle class kid in, in the classroom or the uh, dorm next to you. You don't know that. And then counseling is the same thing. I don't even know what that is. It must mean you're crazy. And I'm not crazy, so I'm not going there. <laughs> and, and if you can't manage that, then you can't manage academic affairs either. But the, you know, little Bill, when Bill's 18 and goes to Tufts University and needs some help with writing, my mom says, go to the writing center, right? All of this is that it's stacked up against these kids. It's not them. It's the structure. And mm -hmm. we can change all these things. We, we know how to, and Sean's absolutely right. Random mentoring ain't going to work. It's, and, and even worse is online mentoring. This, this, there's this thing of, oh. you know, well, if you got a problem, give me a call or text me. That's not the way it works. Texting can help, but it is not a solution. Let's hear from Laura, and then we'll take another question. So just circling back to the where we started about the role of research and in influencing policy. So, you know, I think there's a, an important role that qualitative research plays in documenting and really probing in depth the experiences of particular yeah. students. And then thinking about is your implications, are we measuring in other sources of data the things that are emerging as being important? And that's a way that we can help to change the conversation as well. Right. Thank you. Let's go here. Yep. So my question is for Sarah. You mentioned that the data with our students is actually improving, and the gap with African American students is not. So I was wondering if you could talk more about actually what's happening with that population, like what's going on with them, to help give them the, the knowledge or access that they are using to actually narrow that gap. Yeah. So thank you for your question. It's a complicated story. What we found with Latinos that they were better academically prepared than African Americans, but they're still less likely to go to college. 
African Americans are less academically prepared, but they're still much more likely to go to college. And this is this is a state with a pretty wide array of um, what what Catherine Horn and Gloria Crisp call broad access institutions. So the the admissions is not so selective. So there's opportunities, and there's a lot of community colleges. And then when we look at completion, what we saw was Latinos are more likely to complete. So those who are, do enroll, they are more likely to complete. And our data suggests it's because they're pro they, they have a better level of academic preparation. It's not where it needs to be, but it is better than 10 years ago. With African-Americans, they're more likely to enroll, but not, but much less likely to complete from our data. So, and, and when we pull that apart in our study um, called the racial college completion gap, we found that the, the, the key driving factors for both groups between white, black, and white, Latino, the most negative contributor was racial segregation, right? And that's a proxy for all kinds of things in high school. But then for African-Americans, again, it was academic preparation. And for Latinos, it was about financial aid. So college readiness, if we frame it just as academic preparation, we're going to fail because you need it, but it's not necessary. For Latinos, they, the financial literacy part is not happening. They're more likely to be economically disadvantaged. And I think that's one of the key drivers for lower enrollment at college. For African-Americans, the information seems to be there in a better way, but the academic preparation isn't slowing them down in completing college. So that's how we pull apart the data to try to understand what's happening. I think an, an additional qualitative study or supplementary qualitative would have been fantastic, but I, I only had funding for for the quant side. If anyone wants to fund me for the quality, <laughs> I'm happy to unpack that even further um, uh, with my colleagues. And um, yeah, so I don't know if that helps, but I think having good data tells us where the stories need more unpacking. But you know, school quality is enormously important. And I think we need to investigate more deeply. Uh, why is it that the take up is higher for Latinos students than African-American students. Okay, let's go here, then we'll go all the way to the back of the room to Lance. Thank you for um, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, so obviously, going over to the courses have benefits, they have been uh, in the Pacific made, um, uh, make uh, the path for going to the One of you wants to take that? Well, I think that would be the ideal, right? Where we didn't need to have supplemental programs where we could ensure that everyone had the opportunity to just go to high school and be academically ready. Um, so, you know, I, you know, part of why I think there is some qualitative research that examines the experiences of students in dual enrollment and dual credit types of courses. And the experiences of students are along the lines of things that you said. So being in these courses helps students feel like they can fit in or they, they belong in college. And it helps them to learn how to navigate the system and things like that. Um, but you're right. It would be great if everybody just had that without, without having to have these extra programs. They're tough conversations to have. I mean, uh, the uh, hard to believe, but faculty talking to high school teachers, often the faculty tend to speak like Moses coming down from the mountaintops. And 
hard to believe, again, teachers don't resonate with that attitude too well. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I, that sticks with me is if you interview uh, AP teachers, in writing teachers, AP, AP teachers will say something like 80% of their students in their class are ready for college. Mm -hmm. Then you talk to freshman English teachers, mm -hmm. and it's the inverse. 80% will say they're not ready for college. But it's not simply a conversation that needs to happen between those two, and that's the challenge. It's certainly a great idea, but we can't do everything. So what are those things that we are you know, best attuned to, to create change? Great. Lance? The number one thing we have to do is, is, is we have to make sure that students have access to guidance. So but in, in Texas, and I'm, I'm sure this is not much different in other parts of the country, the, the ratio between uh, uh, academic guidance counselors and students in Texas is 450 to 1, uh, or students to, to guidance counselors. We, 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 don't, uh, we don't have enough of them. We don't train them well enough. Uh, we, we haven't uh, uh, paid enough attention to uh, their responsibilities. A lot of people that are deemed academic uh, uh, counselors or advisors spend all of their time doing scheduling, doing with truancy issues and so forth. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is make sure we have enough counselors uh, and th that should be determined by the character and the nature of the school and that uh, they get uh, they get good training we're trying to experiment in texas with different kinds of approaches i think uh, texas has more uh, uh the, the college advising core which uh, was created about 10 years ago i think we have more high schools with those kinds of near peer counselors than any other state we're trying to supplement regular counseling uh, but the fact of the matter is there isn't enough there is, by the way, there aren't enough at, uh, at the higher education level either. That's one reason students take six, six years to graduate. Nobody's ever told them what, uh, what courses they should take and what's required for a particular major. You know, for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've been playing games. So actually, I've been playing games all my life, but really I'm playing <laughs> games now. And the idea at, was, was just that, is maybe games could be a way that that's a lot of High school students love playing games. So is there a game that can be made that can help increase access to higher ed? And we have a first in the world grant now where we're doing a randomized controlled trial trying to figure it out. And Laura said at the start of this session two words that really resonate with me. One is implementation and the other is innovation. Because the long and short, we've got 30 high schools that we're working with in California, is games can make a difference, but the implementation is mind-boggling. Because simply because a school has the, the technological facility to, to play our game doesn't mean that anybody plays the game. Because this school, the challenge is there's only one person who has the key to the room, and she's out on Fridays. Right. This school, there's an idea champion, and he's such a good guy, 
that he got transferred to another school and the whole thing falls apart. So, you know, it, it's a critical question you're asking and really where we need to come, and again, full circle to what Ray said is, how can we do research understanding implementation and innovation and then help policymakers so that once you get things in place, you get the findings that you actually want? Let me, let me add really quickly, what we're trying to encapsulate <laughs> is some sort of mechanism that's basically generations of college going in a family to help you, the, the a not, a non, a first generation student go to college. And, and the innovations I've read about, um, a couple things are important. Number one, it's, it actually has nothing to do with the school. It's an external partner, an external coach because the school has, is, has too many responsibilities. Guidance counselors, when I talk to Galleons, they're like, we don't have time to deal with that. We're trying to deal with mental health issues and, and other issues. So it's an external person coming in, and not only for college, but through college. So it's to and through an external person, and it's going to be expensive. And then the studies that have been effective, um, Eric Bettinger and Rachel Baker have a nice paper out on coaching. We know nothing about how that plays out in immigrant communities, mm -hmm. because the studies all focus on income and don't take into account race or citizenship. Great. So listen, we have uh, three minutes before the conclusion and your hand has been raised for a while. So this will be our final question. Thank you so much. So there's a bunch of counselor educators around here. Uh, we always do research on um, counselors and college access. And we know that um, Working when students have access, as Dr. Parade said, when students have access to school counselors, it makes a huge difference. Especially the earlier the access, the better. But as many of you also said, school counselors are working around mental health. They're working around so many things. And so our challenge is creating research that then can impact policy where there's more counselors in the school. And so I wanted to find out, in 2042, what do you see the role of the school counselor? And what would we have done in terms of innovation? I mean, that was a great question. He's gone. But no, he's what there. would have happened by 2042 so that counselors who we, I talk about college access constantly in my class. We talk about how you do it. Uh, we talk about marginalized students, everything you've been talking about, but then they get to the school, they get to their internship, and it's crazy what they're doing, none of them. So what would we, what could we do that would then impact policy around school counseling to, to really make a difference that marginalized students, first generation students, can have more access? So I, I'll start on this one because okay. I feel very strongly about this and I, I'm very troubled, right? So yes, we do need to improve the student to counselor ratios, like for sure. But we also need to improve the preparation of counselors. Um, if we look at the curricula of programs that prepare counselors to go into schools with the neediest students, right? There's very little about racial literacy um, and how to make sure that we uh, are not doing counseling in ways that uh, track certain students and, and, and so on. I think that that, that is a, a huge, huge, huge problem that is an urgent need of, of attention by the accrediting bodies that accredit uh, counselor education programs. Um, I'm also, you know, really troubled. I'm thinking about Lance's question around innovation. Um, I don't get a sense that we do enough with the counselors themselves to raise their consciousness about uh, messaging. Um, the message that kids from here don't get into colleges like that, so therefore we need not try. I'm not sure that counselors are fully aware that they do that and the devastating effects that that has on, uh, on particular students and you know, ends up in you know, undermatching you know, uh, students. So I'll stop there in the interest of time. I'll say two quick things. So one, I think we need to recognize that counseling does matter from a policy perspective, just reiterating some things from the previous comments. You know, in Philadelphia, 
the first when the budget is uh, in dire situation, the first thing to get cut is the counselor. Right. Right. So you have some schools with no counselor. The reality is our system, our higher education system, our educational system requires on people trying to figure out how to navigate a lot of complexity. So my vision of the world moving forward would be to make the job easier for counselors. People are going to continue to need individualized <laughs> advice, right, based on their own situation. But if, it would be so much better if it, our system weren't so hard for the counselors to try to figure out, right? So I don't see college counselors going away yeah. in 2042. But, you know, education costs money. And you know, the, one answer you get now is, well, we don't have enough counselors, so we'll have the teacher do it. The problem is, there are two problems. The teacher knows where he or she went to college. So a lot of, you know, well, you can go to Cal. Well, why would you want to go to Cal? And the other is, there's just a lot of technical knowledge that teachers got, have enough problem teaching English, math, science, and that stuff. So we've got to figure out exactly what Sean said, but we've got to have more counselors, not less. In California, it's 800 to 1. I, I think you need a workforce innovation. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, this is really a how to redefine what it is to be a counselor. Maybe you need multiple forms of, of counselors. But the way we uh, investigate teacher education programs, we need to think about counselor education programs as well. And it might be a whole different you know, vocational category that we create. But those are, you know, that's where innovation comes in. Great. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Thank She's you. She's actually in the back of the room. She's been taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> So Raymond, Stella, Laura, and Bill, thank you for a really stimulating conversation. And thank you all for attending and joining with us in the conversation. Take good care. <laughs>